As Joanne was reading that story, it occurred to me, we don't use the word thicket enough. (laughs) That's your assignment this week. Bring the word thicket back into conversation. So for the careful, careful listeners out there, you might recall that last week, when telling you the creation story, I made a claim about how God creates in love with hopes for our flourishing and for our life, right? And then today, the narrative lectionary gives us this passage, where God tells us that Abraham is to sacrifice his son. And Abraham goes through with it until an angel freaks out and cries chicken and points to a ram hiding in a... Well done. Before we unpack what's going on here, I want to spend a few minutes catching you up with what happened in chap- between chapters 1 and chapters 22. Abraham and Sarah are some of the patriarchs and matriarchs of our biblical story, and their story began when Abraham's father left their country and took his family to another land where they were foreigners. When Abraham was 75 years old, God told him to travel again. Well, to, sorry, I've got a hair in my face. Sorry, okay. Um, masks. Um, God told him to travel again to yet another land as a sojourner. So our story of faith begins with immigration, with people seeking refuge and life in new lands. Never forget this. And God promised that Abraham himself would be a blessing and that God would make of him a great nation which is quite a promise to make to an older couple who've had no children. More than the stars of the heavens would be their descendants, God says. So Abraham and Sarah are lifted up as great ancestors of our faith, family tree. And while that's a fine thing to do, it's also important to acknowledge that in their story, they're both kind of shady. Maybe that should give us hope if these two people, can be matriarch and patriarch of our faith tradition, there surely is room for us, right? It also reminds us not to limit the people we think God should and can be working through. And it reminds us not to pretend our ancestors were perfect just because they're our ancestors. So on their journeys, Abraham passes off his beautiful wife, Sarah, as his sister twice. He decides men are going to kill him to take her because of her beauty. And so in order to save his life, he says, she's my sister, here you go. Twice he does this, and God intervenes for Sarah, but not before some traumatic experiences surely have happened to her. Sarah's behavior is also entirely human in some less than admirable ways. Even though God has promised them many offspring, when that doesn't happen in a timeline that one might expect, Sarah and Abraham take matters into their own hands and forget about trusting in God. And Sarah tells Abraham to take her servant girl, Hagar, as another wife, planning to have her give birth to a child for Sarah, which Hagar, the non-consenting woman, does. After Ishmael is born, though, Abraham seems fine with things, and Sarah is not. She's terribly jealous, and she's very mean to Hagar. And she finally then, Sarah, gives birth to Isaac and then sends Hagar and her son Ishmael to die in the wilderness. And Abraham agrees to the plan. Again, God intervenes, but not before Hagar and Ishmael have been through some trauma. So when the author of Genesis writes that God tells Abraham to take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him as a burnt offering, what do you notice? I notice that Isaac is not Abraham's only son. And surely God knows about Ishmael since God has just saved him and his mother. Surely the author of Genesis knows because he's the one that just told us the story. Surely Abraham knows about his other son. What are we to do when scripture gives us an unreliable narrator? What, about, what are we to do when many voices are excluded in the telling of the story? Because this story is told in a way that leaves out a whole lot of details. Like, what is Abraham thinking as he decides to obey this command of God, even though he's ignored plenty of others along the way? 
What does Isaac think when his dad puts him on a pile of wood ready to burn? You can bet that impacted their relationship down the road, don't you think? (laughs) What does Sarah think of the whole situation? I am fairly confident Abraham did not tell her what he was doing. A connection between this text and the sacrifice fly in baseball occurred to me Friday night as we watched the Giants beat the Braves in extra innings. Listen to what Dave, columnist Dave Barry has said about baseball, and that might also be true about this story. If a woman has to choose between catching a fly ball and saving an infant's life, she will choose to save the infant's life without even considering if there is a man on base. Sarah had gone through a lot to have this child. Let's be clear that when couples faced infertility in the time of the patriarchs, and maybe even still today, it is the woman who was blamed for her lack of children. Sarah has been burdened her entire life with her childlessness. And I'm pretty confident if God's message had been delivered to Sarah instead of Abraham, she would have given the Almighty a piece of her mind. Barbara Brown Taylor, in her book, When God is Silent, writes this about what the Jewish Midrash or commentary says about the aftermath of this story. The encounter on Mount Moriah was so overwhelming that Isaac was blinded by it, and Abraham became deaf, and Sarah died of her grief. I don't know if that's exactly what happened to any of those characters, but in truth, When the narrator has already revealed themselves to be somewhat unreliable, it is understandable we want to fill in the blanks. Taylor goes on to say this, Where certain biblical passages are obscure, troubling, or incomplete, perhaps we should leave them that way. Who are we, after all, to defend God? Our job is not to explain them. The discord, like the silence, is God's problem, not ours. I'd argue, though, it's a little bit our problem because we still have people out there lifting up child sacrifice as a faithful thing to do. Maybe not quite in the way Abraham did it, but this year in our country, over a thousand children under the age of 18 have died by gun violence so far this year. In the nine years since 20 children and six teachers died at Sandy Hook Elementary, we have enacted almost no meaningful legislation to curb gun violence. But some currently sitting members of Congress continue to insist that the massacre never happened and that these families are making it up. We still see child sacrifice as a faithful thing to do. Not every child in our country has access to clean drinking water. Not every child has access to medical, dental, and mental health care. Weekly COVID-19 associated hospitalization rates among children and adolescents has risen nearly five-fold between June and mid-August of 2021, the CDC reported. Children are among the people paying the cost when we as a nation refuse to take this virus seriously. I have a friend who pastors a church in a small town in a western state, and her young daughter has a brain tumor, and she cannot go to school in her community because she's the only child who will wear a mask in her class. Her health is too fragile for her to risk catching COVID. This community knows and cares for this child, ostensibly. They have contributed to her medical costs and made meals for the family, but they won't do the simple act of wearing a mask to care for her. And if people aren't willing to sacrifice children, or people are willing to sacrifice children they know and care for, what does that say about how well they're gonna care for children they've never met or who speak different languages? who worship different gods. We still see child sacrifice as a faithful thing to do. As I've said before, and you'll hear me say it again, it is easy for me to find ways that other people are making bad choices. (laughs) How might we, though, be the ones, we all wearing our masks, how might we be the ones making choices that could sacrifice children's futures, their health, and their well-being? Maybe we're more like Abraham than I wish we were. But I wonder what God's view of this story really is. I wonder if when God was testing Abraham, the right answer would have been for Abraham to call out, what is wrong with you? Why would I kill my child? Why would I hurt any child? 
Maybe that's the test God wanted Abraham to pass. Maybe God wants us to value the lives of our own children and other people's children so fiercely that we're willing to take God to task for a terrible idea. Everything I know of God is at odds with the idea that God would want, to kill, want us to kill our children or even be willing to say we would kill our children in order to prove our devotion. I recognize that good therapeutic counseling did not exist back when this biblical story took place, but wow, this is a group of traumatized people who could use some help. They are wounding other people with their unhealth. And as we keep reading through Genesis, we will see how the dynamics of families affect future generations, how trauma keeps getting passed down the line. And many of us have seen it play out in our own lives too. And so let me make a plug for the gifts of counseling. It has been such a help in my life, and I encourage you both to seek it and to create a world that makes it affordable and supported for everyone. One of the parts in, in this text that needs a little exploration for me is the refrain of the Lord will provide. Yes, God did come saving Sarah when her husband passed her off as his sister, saving Hagar and Ishmael when, um, when they were kicked out, saving Isaac with the ram in the thicket. But I think the author of Genesis did not intend for the Lord to provide, to be the excuse we utter when we want God to clean up our messes and our poor behavior. God told Abraham that he would be a blessing for the world, and Abraham either didn't remember or didn't trust the promise and his fears kicked in about his beautiful wife being desired and taken by other men. God did provide a way to clean up Abraham's bad behavior, but it didn't have to happen in the first place. God promised Abraham and Sarah they'd have children, but then they took matters into their own hands, creating the whole triangle with Hagar. God provided a way to clean up their mess, but it didn't have to happen that way. God's provision in much of this story happens when God has to come in and repair our brokenness, our lack of faith, and our refusal to trust. And I'm not arguing that if you just trust in God that bad things won't happen to you sometimes, because we all know that bad things still happen sometimes, regardless of our level of faithfulness. But the stories of Abraham and Sarah and our biblical patriarchs are told for different reasons than why newspapers report on crime. Last week, I said the point of the creation story is to remember who we are in relation to God, who created us in love. Similarly here, the stories of our ancestors in the book of Genesis are told to help people remember our relationship to God. In these stories, God is actively speaking to and with the characters, instructing them, directing them, and we don't hear God's voice in the same way. We hear God's voice through others. We hear it through the person of Jesus. And it can be just as hard or just as easy to understand it as it must have been for Abraham when he heard the call to go to Mount Moriah. Some days we get it right. Some days we don't. When I'm trying to discern where God's voice is among the cacophony of the noise in our world, I try to remember God created the world in love and everything I know of God in, is love. So when I'm discerning what God is calling me to do, or as what happened a while back, if God was calling me to move to a new congregation in the middle of a pandemic, I try to use love as the filter. If I forget to do that, I'm likely to use my ego as the filter or some other metric of achievement. And I firmly believe God still speaks to us today. The question is, are we listening, and are we understanding? Like Abraham and Sarah, we'll get it wrong sometimes, and sometimes it takes a while to hear it clearly. Long before I discerned my call to move here, other people were hearing it for me. Over a period of four months, I had a number of people saying some version of, there's a church that's looking for a pastor, and I think it might be you. It took a while, which is often the case with me, but ultimately, thankfully, I heard God's voice through the voices of others who lifted up gifts that I hadn't quite seen in myself. And I'm so thankful to be here with you now, 
figuring out where God is calling us to go, how God wants to use us to be a blessing for the people of this city. I feel very strongly in the, in the Lord's, about the Lord's provision in my call to move here. Even in the midst of the pandemic with all the unknowns in the world, God will provide. And God still speaks today, so are we listening? And can we hear it? Christopher Hewart offers a meditation, he calls it a loving kindness meditation, which helps me better keep my ears and heart open to hear God's voice. And I invite you to repeat it back after me. May I be filled with faith. May I be a source of hope. May I be aligned with love. And after you pray through that for a few minutes, the meditation turns its focus outward on people we love who have helped and supported us, on people maybe we don't want to love, on people we will never meet. Repeat after me. May you be filled with faith. May you be a source of hope. May you be aligned with love. And after praying that a few, for a few minutes about others, the focus moves again. Repeat after me. May we be filled with faith. May we be a source of hope. May we be aligned with love. What if Abraham and Sarah had been able to pause in the midst of their days and pray that prayer for themselves, for others, for their community? We can't undo the trauma of the Genesis story, and we can't erase trauma from our own lives either, but we can move through it and we can heal what can be healed. So may we be filled with faith. May we be a source of hope. May we be aligned with love. The Lord will provide. Amen.